Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Daryl LeBon, and I am the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the One America Movement. So thank you all for joining us for another episode of Candid Conversations. Candid Conversations is a video series where we will feature someone from the One America Movement Network on our show to get candid about the issues affecting folks in communities across the United States and the toxic polarization we are seeing in our country. We've been covering issues related to the pandemic, race, food insecurity, health disparities, mental health, and so much more. Joining us today are two One America Board America board members, Reverend Dr. Leslie Copeland Toon and Matthew Hawkins. Reverend Dr. Leslie Copeland Toon was ordained into the gospel ministry more than 15 years ago. Dr. Copeland Toon has worked for a number of faith-based organizations and is currently the chief operating officer for the National Council of Churches. She also serves as director of the Ecumenical Poverty Initiative, an anti-poverty ministry which adds a prophetic voice and collective action to the fight to end poverty and is a member of our One American Board. In addition to her anti-poverty work, Dr. Copeland Toon has also worked on a number of other issues, including environmental stewardship, racial reconciliation, domestic violence, human trafficking, education, and healthcare. So welcome, Leslie, to this conversation. Thank you. Good to be here. We also have with us Matthew Hawkins, who is a consultant and writer with over 17 years of experience at the intersection of religion and politics. He formerly served as a policy director for the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, the public policy entity of the Southern Baptist Convention. Building on an earlier decade providing two nationally syndicated radio broadcasts, Matt later hosted a podcast for four years that featured interviews with members of Congress, scholars, and other policy advocates. Matt is currently pursuing a PhD in public theology and serves on our board as well. So welcome, Matt, to this conversation. Thanks, Daryl. Thanks for having me. Great. So we're just going to get into it. And I have a question to get this started. So at One America Movement, we always talk about identities and labels, and both of you are devout Christians. But Leslie, you describe yourself as a progressive, and Matt, you describe yourself as conservative and evangelical. And there's a lot of nuance in that, and there's a lot of, and it means so many different things to so many different people. Um, and it could be sometimes some loaded language. Can you share a little about what these labels mean to you? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, so again, Matt, it's good to see you. Uh, Likewise, Leslie. As well. um, I think for me, and we, when we wrote the, the piece for uh, One America, I talked about, you know, I used to consider myself evangelical, um, but feel like that label kind of has is so loaded and and I don't identify with people who now consider themselves that. I think it's, you know, it's really hard. I mean, progressive meaning what? I mean, I believe I'm a disciple of Christ. Um, I believe that the work that I do for justice is out of my belief in Christ and, and what I believe Jesus would do. So it's in an American context, really, that the word progressive kind of lands on me. I'm not sure that I love it um, that I think it really um, fully encapsulates even my beliefs or what I believe about policy issues or what I believe about um, societal issues either. So I think th the labels are really hard, but you know, if I have to land somewhere, I guess I have to land um, being progressive. And I, I no shade about it. It's just you know, I can I really look at try to look at things through a lens of Christ. Um, you know, I challenge my own self on that. I don't automatically fall in line with any particular group or camp. I try to do my own study and my own discernment about where I stand on any particular issue. And so, um, but yeah, so I feel like it's always awkward um, to talk about the labels um, and to even embrace them in any particular way. Sure. Um, Matt, any what does being conservative evangelical mean to yeah. you? 
Well, the the interesting thing in here is I, I think what Leslie expressed as some some discomfort uh, with these labels. I feel the same thing uh, where I'm from. I, I recognize that even using a label like conservative or evangelical, on the one hand, that's going to draw some people to me. On the other hand, it's going to repel a lot of others. And uh, I always want an opportunity to define them. Uh, so I'm grateful for your question. Uh, I still hold to the evangelical definition that is more theological in nature. In American politics over the last 30, 40 years, uh, it's been more of a polling, a political polling uh, mechanism that, uh, frankly, I don't think is as accurate as it as it ought to be um and that's a lot of backstory i'm leslie's familiar with that i i refer folks to uh thomas kidd's book or a recent book i think he published it last year he's a he's a baptist historian who kind of talks about what is an evangelical uh, i think that's helpful um but as far as uh kind of evangelical in a purely political context um I, your conversations with me over time will will show that I think uh, I don't fit the typical uh, description uh, that that's there. Uh, like Leslie, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Um, I am, have been in the Baptist world for about 20 years. Before that, I, I have kind of a lineage that's kind of a, a, a an ecumenical mutt, as I describe it, um, uh, from family having been raised in the Methodist church to being uh, uh, in the Presbyterian church for a while to uh, worshiping um, and coming to faith in a tradition called the Christian Missionary Alliance, uh, and then ultimately in the Southern Baptist uh, Convention, where I where I am now and have worked professionally in the past. Uh, so that's kind of what I how I use those titles. I'm always even in even in conversations where I'm talking to people like me. Um, I always want to try to differentiate between uh, theological conservatism and a political conservatism. Um, now there's overlap there, or at least there has historically been that, but I want to make sure what, you know, we're, that we're comparing apples and oranges and being relatively precise about our definitions uh, when we use terms like that. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, um, it's good to hear the Christian Missionary Alliance. I went to Nyack College, which is Nyack. a school. Yeah, Nyack. Really? So you don't hear much about the Christian Missionary Alliance, but you know they right. kind of indoctrinate you there with it. That's right. Um, so that's how I found out about them. But um, that's, that's it is good to see. Yeah, it's good to see how you guys both embrace it, um, but also kind of disavow it at certain points. You know, it's it's like give and take. You know, I think that's how it is for a lot of people that. There's some places where we um, find some convergence and other areas where it's just like, mm, that's not necessarily my my cup of tea. So, right. um, yes. So you guys authored this blog post together. So you came together and we're just going to use these terms as a progressive and as a conservative and evangelical um, um, identities. Um, both came together to for author this blog post in the aftermath of Joy Floyd's murder titled Racism is Sin. Can you talk a little bit about that process, given that you come from these two different backgrounds and have fundamentally different beliefs? Um, how are you able to work together and give each other feedback on an issue that issue that many find difficult to discuss? Matt, you want to start? <laughs> I'll start. Um, well, I think... Um, the, the origination of this article was a little complex. I think it came up in the context of uh, us meeting together in a, in a One America board meeting. And uh, that environment allowed us to commiserate and uh, in some cases mourn and grieve what was going on with the George Floyd situation and, and so many other uh, situations here in the country where unarmed uh, African-Americans um, find themselves at a significant disadvantage and, and often end up dead um, in, in the course of interactions with police. And uh, that would break our hearts, regardless of uh, whether we're conservative or, or progressive. Um, but I think the reason that uh, Leslie and I were able to uh, even chat with this and, and much less publish a piece about this was we'd worked in the past. Uh, we'd worked together on Capitol Hill on a number of different issues that are important to both of our respective our respective constituencies. Um, my my uh, kind of folks, my groups are you know kind of right of center kinds of folks, uh, and Leslie's groups tend to be uh, on the left of center on folks. But there are enough of issues like criminal justice reform, um, like predatory payday lending, uh, and some others that we were able to find a lot of common ground on. And so the fact that I think 
Leslie and I were able to able to have a conversation at all uh, was there was some uh, professional background there and some trust um, that allowed us to to have the conversation number one and then try to do something productive with it. Yeah, I think that mutual respect. I, I feel like we like each other, so you know, there's that. Um, I also think you know I was wrestling with the part of fundamentally different beliefs. I think fundamentally we have a lot of the same beliefs. Sure. Um, there are some nuances to it, obviously. You know, I always jo- make this joke about sometimes I go back, you know, 20 years um, when I was really, really young. And, you know, I read something I wrote and I'm like, huh, do I still agree with that? Because, you know, there's a way that life, right, like yeah. teaches you some lessons that you would not have known um, and, and so I think, you know, that there's easy ways for us to have written that even as difficult as it was to even talk about it. And, um, we both kind of landed on as we were kind of going back and forth, this idea from our perspectives, right? Because we are disciples of Christ. So, you know, the sin issue is a big issue. And when we talk about racism as just some interactions between people, um, that aren't nice, it, that really doesn't get to the heart or the core of it. And so we thought that was important to lift up. And again, from our perspectives that where we really are in total agreement, um, we were able to kind of pull the different pieces together and go back and forth. I don't know how many times we went back and forth and nuanced uh, different pieces and added this and added that. So it was, it was a good process, I felt like, um, and an encouraging one. Great. And I mean, as you're thinking about, um, as you've, um, in your blog post, post talking about racism and sin, you've discussed the church's past, um, acknowledging that racism has permeated Christianity for so many years. Um, do you believe um, now that Christians are becoming better at recognizing and calling out that racism when they see it? Or um, if not, you know, what, how can you recommend people to do better to recognize that racism and to call it out? I mean, races, um, I think Dr. King said that the, um, the 11 o'clock hour is the most divided time um, in America, is that in the church, racism is there. In many denominations, you know, race is the fault line between the AME church and the UMC church. That's, that's what happened, you know? But it happened in so many other denominations as well. Do you think we're getting better at calling this out? No, <laughs> we're not. Um, you know, hope springs eternal, I would say. I would say that um, it gives me life and gives me hope uh, to be in friendship with people like Matt and others who are trying to do this hard work. There's so many layers to it. Um, and it, it's hard work. It's not like a picnic. It's not kumbaya. It is digging really deep and going to some very painful places in our past to try to clean out that wound, right? So that we can um, bandage it and heal and be able to move forward in a more healthy way. Um, but it, you know, it, it just is hard work to do. And I think some people back off because they're like, they feel shame or feel guilt, which is not really helpful um, necessarily, you can't, we can't change the past. We can only change the trajectory we're on to change the future, right? So to kind of embrace that in a way that says, I'm going to do this hard work. Um, I think part of the problem it isn't the 11 o'clock hour, um, it's what happens at 12 o'clock and one o'clock, right? It's what happens at the grocery store, it, what, it happens, what happens when people are jogging, what happens when people are you know trying to break up a fight and then going to their car? What happens in these other moments um, that are life and death moments or critical moments? What happens at the PTSA meeting and at the board school board meeting um, and in those other spaces are really a core issue. But I think it has to be my opinion the church uh, that really does this work. Um, in advance that 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 leads really in doing this hard work as a model for the rest of the nation. And, and we're kind of falling behind. But, you know, this is a moment in our history, I think, of racial reckoning that hopefully will 
project us to a better, more healthier space. And I want to turn it over to Matt, but I just want to say, you know, in Baptist life, at least from my Baptist context, we used to always talk about sins of omission and sins of commission, like the sins you commit knowing, I know I'm not doing right, but I'm going to do it anyway. God forgive me, hopefully. Um, and the sins that you, you, oh, you don't really know, you don't recognize in the beginning that as you're engaging in it, that it's a sin. And I think there's something to be said about this racism that is so ingrained in our society that is really a sin of omission for many people. But once it's brought to your attention, then what are you going to do about it? How are you going to self-correct? How are you going to do the work to be able to self-correct and so on? Yeah, I agree a lot with what Leslie said. Um, for an analysis of kind of my own group, uh, predominantly white evangelicals. On the one hand, I'm, I'm more hopeful now. Um, there's reason for hope uh, in the future, but only, only because of awareness. I think this year has, has spiked awareness and pricked the hearts of, of white evangelicals in a way that I have not seen prior. Uh, particularly, say, in comparison to when Trayvon Martin was shot. Um, the George Floyd and the rest of 2020, um, there's there's an awareness uh, and I think a sensitivity among white Christians in America that I haven't seen before. Um, now, what do we do with that? Um, I don't know that many of us know what to do with it, uh, frankly. Uh, I think we're finding it difficult to have conversations about it, even among white folks. Uh, and um, we have a lot of work to be uh, to do. And I think uh, programs like One America help that. And I think uh, public dialogues like this one and uh, collaborations with uh, between people like Leslie and myself, I think help that. Um, it starts to give us some tools. Um, a lot of this has to do with uh, communication and, and how we talk about things and, uh, and that nature. So I, on the one hand, I see reason for hope. I see a, a, a increase in awareness and sensitivity in a good way. Um, but I also do see some resistance. Uh, and I do see that uh, those of us who, who are maybe awoken uh, or um, aware uh, for the first time or or over time have started to become more aware of um, really the different experience that African-Americans have in, in our country, um, we don't exactly know what to do with it. Uh, we don't exactly know what the next steps are. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we are all um, in every community trying to figure out what the next step is or what's the next faithful step could look like. Um, but as you, but as we're figuring this out, you know, we you wrote this blog um, as the nation was grappling with the death of George Floyd, at, um, um, the death of George George Floyd. Um, but another black man, Jacob Blake, was recently paralyzed after being shot seven times in the back in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is on the which is all over the news at this point. Um, racism is an issue that we still need to wrestle with as a nation, as these tragedies are ongoing, they really have not stopped. Um, you both mentioned a little bit that um, conversations are happening within each respective group. I'm curious, you know, what have those conversations looked like in the groups? Um, and has there been any interaction with your piece, with your blog posts, any feedback you've gotten from folks within your groups um, based on your blog post or what have you? So. I'll I'll go first on this one. Um, <laughs> honestly, so when I use social media, um, we post a blog post, something I've written, something I'm sharing. Uh, it's it's almost particularly on uh, Facebook and Twitter. It's it, it's education to me. It's somewhat some intelligence maybe about. Uh, how people engage with it um, and to what extent they engage with different types of content. And uh, always when I post pictures of my now four-year-old daughter, those are always the highest activity um, <laughs> on my social media, as, as you understand, Daryl, as, as, <laughs> as a new dad, congratulations. Um, but, uh, and then, you know, if, if I engage something that's a social conservative issue, um, I get a certain kind and volume and a certain 
volume of attention. Um, if I if I engage on something that's uh, a little more centrist or left of center, um, I, I get less less engagement, but still kind of an orbit of participation and, and engagement, clicks, likes, that kind of thing. I got to tell you, when I post anything about race um, on my Facebook page or even Twitter, I get little to zero interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, I'm not sure what to do with that necessarily. Uh, I just notice it's different. And uh, yeah. this blog post uh, was kind of the same. Um, and in, including on my podcast, we, I talk with a Christian and a Muslim, uh, or I'm a Christian. I talk with my Muslim friend about religion and politics. We did a, a part one and part two episodes on America and racism and, uh, not a whole lot of attention. Um, so it's not just this piece. Um, so that's, I'm kind of scratching my head on that. I kind of had to reach out and press people for some for some feedback, even even some candid critical feedback, and I got some, uh, which yeah. I'm, I'm grateful for. Uh, but I had to I had to reach for it. Um, it didn't didn't really come in the way I kind of thought it might, I, either good or bad. Really. Yeah, I got mostly positive feedback, um, but a few amens. Um, but I do think you know to Matt's point there can be radio silence on difficult um, issues to kind of grapple with. And the idea, of course, that racism is a sin, you know, I can see how that would strike somebody, um, strike a chord that someone might not know what they should say or how they should engage, right? Like, you know, what do I do with that if I've never heard of it um, spoken that way? If we talked about my sin of gluttony or we talked about sexual sin or we talked about, you know, lying and stealing in, in Sunday school, but we never talked about what what it means for racism to be a sin. I, I could see that rubbing somebody, <laughs> um, somebody having to kind of grapple with that. I'm okay yeah. with that. I just think, you know, in order for us to really move forward as a nation, we have got to be able to have these difficult, these candid conversations. There's just no way around it because um, even I'd rather a, an honest discussion where you tell me what you really think and hurt my feelings and we kind of go from there than for you to just tell me God is good all the time and all the time God is good, right? Like, right. yeah, and, <laughs> right, yeah. right? So, so how do we have these truthful conversations? That's why I really think it, it is part of the church's role to lead in this, to lead us in a more honest, truthful way, um, to find our way. Nobody has the answer to it all. It's so ingrained in our society, nobody could possibly have an answer. Um, but there are many answers and many solutions that we can work on together. We just gotta do the work. All of us have to do the work um, to make it happen. And some of that, yeah. some of the, some of that work I learned, I, I, I know this generally speaking, um, but I learned even specifically uh, that there were there are terms that we used in our essay that uh, people, uh, particularly right of center, uh, wish we had defined. Um, that was a critique, and in some cases I thought it was fair, in other cases it was a little bit of whataboutism. Um, uh, but I, I, there are a few terms that we, pr I probably could have, uh, defined a little, a little differently or, or more specifically. Um, uh, but it's, that kind of paints the picture of kind of, kind of the rub. So we're, we're trying to kind of do this thing together, uh, in one essay. Um, and we're trying to communicate to kind of, kind of both our respective groups, um, but also respect each other's voices. Uh, and I think that that proved uh, a challenge, uh, not surprisingly, um, but it also carries with it risk. And uh, I think it's it, when you're trying to respect each other's voices, um, we're still trying to, it, it takes a lot of wordsmithing, frankly, uh, <laughs> both, right? Right, yeah. Leslie, that was yeah. a process, yes. a lot of wordsmithing can be like, I hear what you're saying and I agree with you, but maybe let's use this word instead of this word. Uh, so right. that, so that it communicates to this, uh, this group over here, uh, or so that it communicates to this group over here. Uh, and sometimes you can only learn that, uh, by engagement and, and, uh, 
and kind of exposing ourselves to the risk. Uh, I think there's value in that. And uh, that's why I, why I did this with, with Leslie. Uh, but it was a learning experience. Um, and I think uh, the most positive feedback that I got was the fact that uh, I and Leslie partnered together, um, that there enough people noticed enough differences between here that uh, they, they were encouraged uh, that someone like Leslie and someone like me could uh, come together and collaborate on such uh, contentious issue. Uh, like race in America. Yeah, uh, even though there there may be some apparent or or or, or people may uh, misjudge and say that there's all this difference between both of you, you do agree all, about a lot of things, and I think you came together and said we agree that racism is the sin, and I think that's a good sign for people out there that people who do not look like you were not raised the same way as you. Um, you can still hold to similar values and that's what you should be fighting for or working toward. Yeah. Yeah. I would say too, you know, some of this honestly um, is confusing to me because it just seems obvious that somebody shouldn't put their knee on somebody's neck in eight minutes and 46 seconds and, you know, kill, kill them and in, in plain view. It's, so that doesn't really, I don't, I'm confused by <laughs> some of it. Um, and I think part of like, there was, we both understood that that's not right, you know, from our Christian yeah. perspective, even um, that there's something deeply wrong with that. And, there, and then there are other examples. And I guess sometimes I just wonder, I know that if something doesn't impact you directly, your approach and your thinking about it may be different. Um, but there are so many ways that the gospel calls us to care for people and to be concerned about people and things that don't directly impact us. I just get a little honestly frustrated and confused when when it seems so obvious. Like it just, it's like, why are we, what are we debating exactly? <laughs> like, yeah. you know. Um, and so, but, you know, I mean, I think that's where Matt and I are. That's why we've been able to work together on poverty and payday lending, criminal justice, other things, because we get it. Like, this seems, this is a no brainer, right? This is an easy one. Absolutely. So at One America, we like to close these conversations on a more um, hopeful note. You know, this is, um, some would say this is some heavy, there's some heavy stuff, right? And we work with people across religious, racial, and political divides. But one thing we share, is a, share in common is a vision and a hope for a future that really lives up to the American promise. So when you think about your communities and your role within them, and what, what do you think we as Americans or as Christians can do to really make a change when it comes to racism on a macro and micro level? Like, what's, what's some real solutions? How can someone get involved in this and in this work? Leslie, you first. I'm, I'm going first. Okay. The I'll, one who's struggling. I'll, so yes, you go first. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you, you, you can gather your thoughts. I have a, I have a couple I, I can share. Um, I think the, the big question is uh, I focus on the two words you mentioned, micro versus macro. Uh, and I think the macro is really difficult to get our hands on. Um, where I have seen changes in the micro. And for example, um, personal relationships, um, like with Leslie, like with some of my former colleagues at ERLC, like uh, when I finally, uh, as uh, for eight years in Washington, had uh, close family, uh, close church members um, or fellow church members going to the same church uh, who, who were African-American and had uh, a different experience than me. Uh, and frankly, who enabled me to ask some awkward questions. Um, friend, people who were friends and brothers of, and sisters in Christ who um, allowed me the space and, and the risk of kind of raising my hand and saying, hey, I have a white boy question over here. Um, this has helped me understand. Um, and without the patience and the grace of those brothers and sisters, um, I'm not writing this piece with Leslie. Um, and what I was able to hear from those experiences is a better understanding um, and uh, 
created within me, I think, a, a greater empathy than I had had um, for a long period of my life. Um, I was one who kind of was educated and taught that a lot of this, the race stuff uh, was history, even distant history. Uh, and it wasn't until I saw some people um, suffering um, and being discriminated against who are part of my generation uh, that really made me pause and take notice. Uh, one of those experiences was a pastor. Uh, he's now a seminary professor uh, within the SBC, but um, someone who's maybe a, maybe a few years older than me, uh, who was fired, uh, kicked out of his church several years ago uh, in the 21st century um, for a, and a white guy who was trying uh, to uh, minister and love and bring into membership. I forget the, what the particular details were, um, but it was over a race issue at a local church and for someone who's a you know a gen x white guy to have that kind of experience in a church just kind of rocked my world um and yeah. so that that kind of micro uh that sharing of those kind of micro experiences um coupled then with later uh friendships um that i've had with uh black brothers and sisters um that's made the difference for me uh and i got we got to figure out how to uh amplify I think those kinds of stories and interactions. I don't have the secret necessarily, uh, other than to obviously promote and, and affirm uh, some of the great programming that One America features. It's part of why I'm on your board, uh, is because I'm excited about those projects. I think it's unique, um, but that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for ways to amplify and 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 perpetuate those kind of micro experiences. Yeah. So I struggle a little bit with hope these days, to be quite honest with you. Um, this week was a really challenging week um, as the events unfolded in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And, um, you know, thank God uh, Jacob Blake is alive, um, but certainly his life has been ever forever changed. He's um, paralyzed and, um, you know, then the young, a 17 year old, um, shooting and killing two people who are protesting. I mean, it just really are these soul issues um, that are hard to, you know, having to talk to my son about it um, and my daughter. And, you know, it's just really, it's just really hard. Um, I will say that um, the next generation um, gives me hope. Um, I joined, I told uh, Andy, who's the executive director of One America, when I joined, I was like, I'm doing this because I need hope. Like I need to be in places, um, I need to feed hope. I shouldn't say I, need, I have hope um, in a spiritual sense, but you know, to feed places that offer hope in another narrative, as opposed to some of the everyday realities that we deal with as it, as it pertains to race. Um, so I do get hope from that. I do. Um, we had um, the National Council of Churches had a new and emerging faith uh, voices uh, town hall this week. And uh, some of the younger people on that panel uh, really gave me a lot of hope as to where we're going. Um, and so, you know, I'm fighting, honestly, to keep hopeful, to stay hopeful and to create spaces both on a micro level and on a macro level um, in my role working with churches to make sure that there's space for hope, right? <laughs> like that there's just, yeah. there's just enough space uh, for a breath even so that hope can live. Um, and so that's what I would probably say to that. Well, unfortunately that's our time for today. Thank you both for um, joining us. Um, it's been great chatting with you and, and meeting with you all virtually. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, but before we head out, I want to give you both an opportunity to share your social media handles and any additional information and websites where folks can go to learn more about you and the work that you do. So um, who went first last time? <laughs> uh, okay, so I think Matt. I went I first last time. So Leslie, go for it. Okay, so my Twitter handle is at Kopi, T-W-O, Kopi2. It's a nickname from 
high school. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't think anybody would ever follow me, but uh, or that I use Twitter as much as I do. But at Kopi2, I have a blog that I try to keep up with, um, Mondays at the altar.com. And then the National Council of Churches is nationalcouncilofchurches.us. Great, great. So everyone go on and follow follow her and um, read her blogs, Mondays at the Altar. And Matt? Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter at MT Hawk, Matthew T. Hawk. And uh, I'm I'm there and follow Leslie, of course, uh, as, as I do One America. Um, my weekly podcast is called Crossing Faiths. Uh, it's available wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, even on YouTube, um, we're doing the video thing now and have a number of guests uh, lined up uh, that can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, also at crossingfaiths.com, where I, as a Christian, talk with my Muslim friend about politics and religion, uh, which we think is uh, a unique offering. Um, it might be a little too niche to find much of an audience, but it's there and uh, we have we have fun with it. And then my personal website is MatthewTHawkins.com. Uh, there's, uh, there's not a lot of new content there, but uh, you can learn more about my work and uh, some of the stuff I've written there. Thank you both so much for that. And go ahead and um, follow uh, Matt as well. Um, all right, everyone, but we also want to make sure you check out our website, which is www.oneamericamovement.org. You also can find us on Facebook at One America Movement and on Twitter at one underscore underscore America. Don't forget to put in both of the underscores. <laughs> or you'll, go to, you'll follow the wrong folks. Uh, but um, one underscore underscore America on Twitter. And if you like this conversation, would like to learn to have difficult conversations with your friends and loved ones, you can also check out coronarebuild.org. Um, that's a special project we are running, um, empowering here at the One America Movement, and you can check out coronarebuild.org for more information. Make sure you all continue to tune in weekly for our candid conversations. Until next time, enjoy your weekend. Thank you to Leslie and thank you to Matt for um, having this conversation. And thank you all um, listeners and watchers for watching. Um, see you next time. Goodbye now. Bye, Daryl. Thank you, Daryl. God Bye. bless.